you. It was um, funny, at lunchtime I was walking, um, trying to regulate myself, and thinking, which is worse, waiting uh, till the end of the day to talk to such a large group of obviously really richly experienced people, or what I was doing last weekend, which was going down a very technical piece of white water river in my canoe, but even worse, I was um, leading a group of people who hadn't done much before, which was a horrendous responsibility. And then I thought, well, there's actually a very interesting metaphor here, because um, I think I probably wasn't um, grounded in myself enough um, at the start of that, um, having been worried about everybody else and what might happen. So, of course, at the first major set of rapids, I came out of my boat. In fact, I was told afterwards that it really calmed down the others, because actually, as boaters, we know we're all between swims, so even the greatest experienced canoeists are between swims. And the even funniest thing was, um, there's a, uh, two ladies in a tandem boat following me, and apparently before I went down, um, one of them said to the other, whatever you do, follow Sue's line exactly. <laughs> um, and after that they realised, okay, the leaders, take a certain course, but you have to be able to very quickly make your own decisions because there's boulders, there's a sudden twist, your boat spins round, but equally we've all got different boats, we've all got different bodies. So one of the things that uh, I guess I want to stress is I'm going to talk to you about some of the things I do as a sensory motor psychotherapist, but and, and, and I've been massively informed by some wonderful trainers, by Pat Ogden's work, by Janina Fisher, who I think some of you know her work. Um, but actually, it's what we do, what we bring um, in an integrative way to the work, what we've learned from our clients, what we do with each individual, um, that actually creates something unique. And just as you have to do when you're going down rapids, you have to very quickly adjust. You have to be able to think, oh shit, I'm now spinning around, I'm going the wrong way, what do I do? And I think that's one of the things that I find about working with very troubled, troubled traumatised people. There are many moments when I think, I have not the faintest idea of what to do next. But actually, somehow, you find a way. So, although I'm going to be talking about, or, or trying to explain what I think are some of the essential points about sensory motor psychotherapy. Um, these are, these are, it's, it's one dimensional in a way. And it's partly <coughs> one dimensional because I fundamentally believe that the work I do, the work we all do, is, is really embedded in relationship. So this is my integrative perspective. Um, and I will try to talk about my thoughts about working with this particular client who I've chosen to call Afran. In essence, sensory motor psychotherapy is a, a body-oriented talking therapy. And I think that's one of the reasons why I was drawn to it, because it integrates uh, thinking about the body, working with the body, but also working with thoughts, um, working with emotions and working with, with the relationship. And for me, I was so excited when I found Sensory Motor because it integrated all the other different trainings and work I'd done in the past. It's a very relational uh, way of working. Um, how the therapist uses him or herself is really important. It's also very collaborative. Theoretically, it's informed by contemporary research on trauma, on attachment theory, um, neuroscience, and neuroplasticity. And for me, one of the things that always gives me hope is the knowledge now that our brain can constantly change itself. And I like to think sometimes about a traditional talking therapy as kind of horizontal. And certainly, going back to Freud's day and perhaps for a few de decades afterwards, the idea was if you just talk about it, if you get it out, uh, that, will, that will be healing. But we can't just do the horizontal level. Something's needed to go deeper into a process to enable access to other structures in the brain. So not just the, the top thinking, talking brain, but also the limbic structure. 
and that's where, where change can come. One of our prime aims um, in sensory motor work is to regulate people in the moment and to help them to develop better self-regulating skills. And I'll say more about that. It's a very experienced near therapy. We're really work working with what's going on in the moment and it's experimental. So it entails a lot of mindful studying of present moment experience so that we can access what's implicit, um, the, the elements of the trauma that have been laid down as procedural memory, but may not yet be narrative memory. In our work, we distinguish between trauma and developmental injury. The latter we could also uh, think of as attachment-based injuries. And probably, um, I would imagine that there will be people in the room who have experienced trauma, but probably all of us, in one way or another, have experienced some form of developmental injury. And we work with them in different ways, but we acknowledge that they're closely intertwined. So you could think of a double helix with the, the two uh, entwined together. So what do we mean by trauma? Well, it's an experience when the individual's ability to integrate his emotional um, and sensory experience is overwhelmed. We can think of all trauma-related disorders as disorders of integration. The person experiences a threat to life, bodily integrity and sense of self. And that's subjective sense. It may not be an objective threat to life, but it's how the individual perceives it. And this is very important as well. The survival brain, our limbic system, and the animal defensive systems are engaged. So let's think about this, this gentleman's experience. We know that he was born into an unsafe world. We know that he's witnessed violence. There were perhaps threats to his own life and he's needed to flee his country. And I would imagine that on that journey there may have been a number of very dangerous experiences which may have been impossible to integrate. I would imagine too that in that process of coming to a strange country, of, of being trying to get uh, leave to remain, he may have experienced humiliation, he may have felt rejection. Then what do we mean by developmental injury? So that includes childhood experiences which don't involve <coughs> life-threatening experiences, but in which caregivers have failed to meet developmental needs and in some way cause, but don't repair emotional distress. Love and support may, be, may have been conditional. For instance, you're only loved if you're um, very successful. <coughs> In which the child's truth is disconfirmed. <coughs> Philip Bromberg talks about the trauma of disconfirmation <coughs> or non-recognition. -reg where in order to be loved, in order to fit in with the family's way of doing things, you have to kind of uh, suppress or dissociate from aspects of yourself. And developmental injury can result in lifelong limiting beliefs, negative self-concept, and unresolved relational and attachment patterns. So we don't know about our friend's childhood, we can only speculate, but I certainly wonder what was it like for him not to have a dad? What meaning would that be for him? I wonder if his mum was preoccupied and frightening, and therefore how, how available could she be? I'm also thinking about the multiple losses and that, what that would have meant for a child, for a teenager. And so I'd be listening out for how he speaks about himself. I'd be, list, or I'd be aware of how is he relating to me, and that might give me some clues. I said it's a, a body-oriented talking therapy, so why, why do we attend so much to the body? The body tells the story. 
It's a source of information about procedurally learnt tendencies. And as van der Kock says, the imprint of trauma is in our animal brains, not our thinking brains. So it may be that there's no narrative for certain things, but the way somebody moves, the way they stand, um, is echoing something about how they had to adapt to very frightening events years ago. The body's also a resource, and we do a lot of work uh, using the body, using movement uh, and posture to help people feel more resourced in the present. So a, a simple resource which I was using for myself a moment ago, and which I often try with people, is, is grounding. Um, which is just, can you feel your feet on the floor? Maybe you'd like to try it now. So if you put both your feet on the ground, and really, really sense yourself just pressing down. And then see if you can lift your spine. Imagine you've got a giraffe neck, so you're really a long, long spine. Then just notice the space for breathing. Notice what feels different about that. Maybe a little bit more alert, a little bit more awake. Certainly, that's going to give you some very different feelings from you know, kind of crouch down, um, spine slumped, which often, after very frightening events, that's often a posture people will adopt. So just simple ways of experimenting with posture um, can help people. From the start, we're going to be looking for how the trauma might be lodged in the body and what it might tell us about developmental injuries. And this is really important. We're going to look for signs of autonomic dysregulation. And the way we think about this is by using the window of tolerance model. I'm sure some of you are very familiar with this. If I had a pound for every time I've drawn it on my first meeting with a, a client, I'd be a very rich woman by now. So when something is very frightening, when it overwhelms us, it can either take us into hypoarousal, so that's above the line, when there's too much, there's too much feeling, there's too much uh, agitation in the body. And you can't think clearly in that state. Or alternatively, people may switch off, so they go below, below the line into hypoarousal, where everything's kind of flat and numb, and in extremes that would be a, a dissociated state. Only in that middle zone, which I sometimes call the just right place, can we be able to think and feel. Um, so it's a calm and alert place. And the big problem about just talking about the trauma is that it takes people out of their window of tolerance. I think a lot of people come to therapy expecting that that's what they've got to do. They've got to talk. And you should see the relief on people's faces when you say, actually, I don't need to know about it at the moment. And I certainly fully agree that sometimes witnessing, listening to the story is massively important. But only when people can manage um, the arousal and the emotions that come. So we're, we're really thinking about we need people to keep in that window of tolerance and we need to build up a range of strategies to help people um, when they go out of it. So that's why I often think about a warning zone. What's telling you that you're beginning to go into the red? I might colour code this. What, what will, how will your body tell you if you're going into the blue? And then the more people get to know those things and also what triggers that, then they feel a little bit more in control of their bodies. So I would probably teach Afran about the model and I would ask him questions like, when you're depressed, where are you on that chart? When you're feeling anxious, where are you then? Are you ever in the middle? What helps you get back there? And could we think together about some other strategies? For instance, some people use alcohol or drugs to bring themselves down or up. And obviously, they're doing their best they can to regulate themselves. 
some people use self-harm, uh, some people get very, very busy. Um, so, and we've probably all got a, a, a range of our own strategies which are trying to regulate us. The other thing I'm going to be looking for and thinking about is missing resources and experiences. Obviously for Afran, a really big missing experience is safety. So from the start I'm going to be thinking about what will create safety in this room. I wonder how many of you actually ask people, um, does it feel comfortable where our chairs are? Would you like me to move back a bit? What, what happens if I move my chair? Does your heart race a little less? Is it easier to breathe? Or would you like it if I angled my, my seat? And we can quite quickly, I think, get to know of things in the room that trigger people and take them out of their window. Another thing which, for many trauma survivors, has been missing is choice. So I think that's a part of the collaborative aspect of the work. How can we keep offering choice? about what, where we go and what we do. So many of our questions will start with, would you be willing? Or how would it be if, but really stressing, and it's absolutely okay to say no. Another missing experience is for people to have acts of triumph. That was what um, uh, somebody called Shanley, who was a contemporary of Freud, uh, it was his term, so ideally, if something frightening happens, if we can defend ourselves, afterwards we can feel that sense of triumph that we'd, uh, our body had moved in a particular way, um, and then we can feel relief. So certainly there were loads of high fives when we finished our river journey the other day, because, I'm not so sure about me, but certainly all the, the newbies were really feeling an act of triumph, because they had, they had succeeded. Um, and there are ways of working in sensory motor where we can help people to reconnect with um, certain movements that give them a sense of triumph and confidence. Another resource I'll be thinking about is boundaries. Trauma is so often a lack of boundaries, a violation of boundaries. And at simple levels, can my client say no? Can he stand his ground? How could we find ways to help him? Be able to do that. We also need to be able to reach out to socially engage with people, to ask for help. Is that possible for him? And we need to find ways to move away from, to run away, to avoid. I'm going to be looking too for actions that perhaps wanted to happen at the time of the trauma that couldn't happen. And we can think of two sets of hardwired action systems, which we, we all have. The, the defensive action systems and the action systems of daily life. So on the one hand, we have social engagement. Actually, our first port of call as a social animal in danger is, can I reach, run to, call for somebody else? If that's not possible, can I fight my way out of danger? Or can I flee? So they are mobilising, they, they activate us. We've also got the immobilising strategies to freeze um, or to go into a state of shutdown or feigned death. Then we have the systems of daily life to be able to attach, caregiving, to regulate energy, um, affiliation, reproduction, exploration. If you think about it, we're hunter-gatherers, so we needed to be able to explore the world um, and play. The big problem with trauma is it means that these systems are online uh, and, and hijack our ability to manage daily life. And that's, for, for severely traumatised people, that's um, often years afterwards. So I'd be thinking, which systems does Afran use most? Which does he use least? And again, how can we foster some of the daily life systems? And that might be drawing in other aspects of um, the support that he's receiving. Another model which 
is fundamental to um, sensory motor work is structural dissociation. So it's a slightly different take on um, dissociation. And it, again, it's about what's hardwired into our systems. So after any, any traumatic, scary event, we will have a, a getting on with life part of self, and other parts of self hold, hold the trauma, the memories, the emotions, the body sensations that go with it. So let's say that on the river, maybe my coming out of my boat had been more scary than it was, or, uh, rather than a bit ridiculous. Um, but that I'm still, you know, I wasn't physically injured, I could still get down the river. Um, and then let's say, thankfully I didn't because I was exhausted, but let's say I'd had to drive home afterwards for three and a half hours. So somehow I would have had to get into my adult getting on with life self to be able to, to do that drive. And then sure as eggs, as eggs, when I got home, I'd be a mess. I'd be shaky, just really tearful, my more childlike self. Because that's what we do. If the trauma isn't too overwhelming, we, we, we keep going. Then think of a child who lives in a dangerous world. Somehow a child manages to go to school and shut off what's been happening. And if trauma is repeated, it may mean that to survive and get on with life, the person needs to develop segregated parts of self. So we can have one part of the self which might be a fight part, a flight part, a freeze, a submit, an attach part. So I was speculating about what might be the pattern for Afran. And to some extent, until I was with him and could see his body, I wouldn't know. So from the description we had, I didn't know if there'd be any, any elements of, of um, his presentation which might say there was a fight part of self. But how would I tell in his body? What would you look for in the, in the body that might tell you that somebody was in fight mode? Sorry? Tension. Tension, yeah. And particularly the upper body, so if somebody's fists clench, if you see clenched shoulders, tension in the jaw, that might mean they're more in fight mode. How about flight? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so often you see jigging legs, and that's often a sign that somebody's going into flight. So I was thinking, well, Afran has been on the run for a long, long time. We know he has anxiety, and um, so that might be relevant. We also know he has nightmares, so that would be much more a free self. And we know he has panic attacks. Depression often fits with submit, but I wondered too about guilt, about shame, about humiliation. And in terms of attachment, we know that he was loved and loving, and, and I sense loyal to his family. And where I've got to whisk through, we think very much in terms of a phased approach to trauma therapy. And the first phase, phase is all about establishing safety, about symptom reduction. And that, in a way, is the most important part of the work before really working on processing memories. So we'd be doing a lot of work to develop skills uh, to help Afran manage arousal. But at some point, it would be important to work on the memories. And because he's lost so much of his own life and culture, I guess the third phase of integration and reconnection with ordinary life is also going to be very important. I said that sensory motor is an experience near therapy, so we're constantly looking for the presence of the past in the present. How people organise their experience, so this is an unconscious organising, um, based on the traumatic events that have happened. And we try to help people to mindfully study their experience. So behind any experience, whether it's something in the moment or remembering it, we will have thoughts about it, certain emotions, 
body sensations, impulses to move, and our sensory perceptions. And we try to use a form of mindfulness to constantly ask people, when you think about that, what's happening in your body now? Or, as you feel that trembling, are there some emotions that go with it? Or any beliefs? Or when you're aware of your fists clenching, is there a memory or image that goes with that? Partly we're doing this because as soon as you start to uh, use mindfulness, you're using the top part of the brain. You're, um, you're pulling somebody out of the limbic system. It's also making sure that they're not flooded with information because we're, we're looking at little chunks of it. But that sort of questioning can then help people drop down into deeper experiences. To either work directly with the body, to work with a child state, so somebody might slip into a, um, a being more like um, the young child who was hurt. But it also enables us to work with experiments. Um, and sometimes we're also trying to kind of kickstart defensive actions that were meant to happen. So let's say uh, somebody couldn't fight, couldn't push away, couldn't run, we will be trying little experiments which help the body to experience those things in the safety of the present, in the safety of a, a, a containing relationship, to give the body an experience of what Peter Levine called a truncated experience, but now it can happen. I'm just going to very quickly um, round off, or even though there's a lot more I'd like to have said, Van der Kolk says trauma treatment must restore a sense of safety in the body and complete the unfinished past. So that's why we're constantly trying to find ways to access the, these incomplete actions and find a way to, to, to help them to happen. Ron Kurtz, who was um, in a way the forerunner of sensory motor psychotherapy and Pat Ogden <coughs> used, developed a lot of his work, he said the goal of therapy is not any particular experience. It's a change which organises all experiences differently. A change in the way of experiencing. To make that kind of change, we must deal with meanings and not just experiences. We must bring out the meaning of the way we organise experience, the way that we do things, the way we put our world together, perceive it and think about it. He also said, Every client is an experience that wants to happen, not a problem to be solved. And I think we can get kind of locked into agendas and trying to fix things. But actually, once we can help people access a slightly different state of mind, a different state of consciousness, uh, linking with Mark, what Marx said, sometimes the wisdom of the body uh, can enable people to find what they really, really needed. And when that happens, sometimes the story might never need to be told. But what does happen in, in a sensitive, safe relationship, the, the old story can constantly be updated in the context of our relationship.